This is chapter 44. And uh, as we begin always with a chant today, we thought we'll dedicate this chant to Lord Ram, since uh, I think he held a special place in Gandhiji's heart. I believe his last words, Gandhiji's last words were, Hey Ram. So let's honor that particular devotion there.
No matter which form God uses to, chooses to manifest himself, it's always a blessing to sing his name in that particular form. Jai Ram. So today, let's open ourselves to that consciousness of Lord Ram, the presence of Gandhiji, and the principles that he lived by and expressed throughout his life. Let's also add the presence of the great ones, masters of Kriya Yoga, and especially Yogananda Ji. Because through him, we get to have a closer understanding of what all these saints who lived in India and who changed India have to offer us and inspire us in our daily lives. So let's just take a few seconds of silence and openness and receptivity. to their presence. on page 422 and we left it at that fun little moment where you know, uh, Yoganandaji Ji talks about Mirabai's hands being busy at the charka and we were talking about our hands being busy all the time with our phones and suggesting perhaps it would be nice to find other ways to keep our hands somewhat busy with some goal in mind you know the charka produced something tangible and something real so it would be lovely to learn something with our hands that could find in our idle moments um, means not just to keep them engaged but to create something meaningful through them Mirabai's hands were soon busy at the charka, omnipresent in all the ashram rooms, and indeed, due to the Mahatma, omnipresent throughout rural India. Gandhi has sound economic and cultural reasons for encouraging the revival of cottage industries. But he does not counsel a fanatical repudiation of all modern progress. Machinery, trains, automobiles, the telegraph, have all played important parts in his own colossal life. Fifty years of public service, in prison and out, wrestling daily with the practical details and harsh realities in the political world, have only increased his balance, open-mindedness, sanity, 
and humorous appreciation of the quaint human spectacle. These uh, last few qualities are interesting to see. When Gandhi was a young man, he wholeheartedly embraced all, all aspects of modern life. As we said, he was you know, trained and studied, grew up much more in the English system. And so modern convenience was a marvel. It's a wonderful thing to do. And he embraced it wholeheartedly. Then he comes to India and he joins the Indian struggle. And now he completely rejects them for a while. And you see, even us as individuals, you know, we're always swinging to extremes. If I have to, you know, do a diet, it's suddenly I'm fanatical about that. And I just now, uh, just till yesterday, I was eating everything I wanted and meat and whatever. And now today, I'm just not going to eat anything. And I'm, you know, every, when we also enter the spiritual path and sometimes in our zeal, we really like to swing. And, and part of it is, is appropriate because we've been moving, you know, like the pendulum. We've been in this direction for so long that it's almost appropriate that we kind of move in the opposite direction somewhere to balance that energy out. But eventually, and this is what Yoganandji is brought, you know, bringing to our attention, eventually through our experience, what we're trying to achieve is balance. We're not, achieve, we're not trying to be on either end of the extremes because no matter, you know, Maya on this particular extreme or the fanaticism of you know, I know exactly what's right in my way, what I believe is the only true way, both ends kind of lead to their own versions of bondage and their own versions of karma. But it's right in the balance, right in the center that, you know, it's both and, this is something our guru would always say, it's not either or, it's always both and. And you can see that in the beginning, you know, Gandhiji was a little bit more all right, now we will reject everything that is modern and we will only go for, you know, whatever is the simplest. We'll go back a thousand years and, you know, establish this old way of doing things. And of course, he realized by his own life that a lot of these modern realities, the telegraph, the automobiles, trains, they were all part of, in fact, allowing him to do what he did. He couldn't get across India easily back then if he could, if he only had to travel by bullock cart or by foot. So you start to realize that, wait a minute, every aspect has a way to make it positive and a way to make it negative. And the balance isn't so much to reject, is to find in everything what's going to be the uplifting, most meaningful way to use it. And today, as we're talking about phones, you know, social media or whatever, the internet is really one of those um, double-edged swords. There's wonderful ways to use it, and then there are just like really horrible ways to get entangled in it. And what would balance be? Is it to say I reject, you know, all internet and all devices, and well, that somebody could perhaps do that, but they'll also realize then in doing that, their ability to connect with people, they'll isolate themselves, and if that's what they want, that's that's a different idea altogether. But where do I find that balance? And the words here are. In time, you see, 50 years of experience. It takes time, of course. But what has it led to? Increased in his balance, open-mindedness. Just open-mindedness about, oh, wait a minute, my way is not the only way. There's a lot else going on, and I need to tune into it. And it's not, as Swami always said, don't be too open-minded that your brain. brain falls out. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, at least... Keep the possibility always open that there is more to know, that there is more to experience. Sanity, I like this word sanity, you know, because we can easily, when we get, we can get lopsided. We can get mentally, I don't know what the right word is, but blocked and unbalanced in that process even. And we see that. You see the people who have very, very strong principles on one hand, they generate a lot of power because just fulfilling and living by a principle itself has a lot of energy, both negative and positive, which is weird, but it's just the law. If you are committed to something, you generate power. But you see in certain such cases that all, um, I don't know what the right, but sanity goes out the window. It's just like y you cannot even hear yourself anymore. Some of the statements you'll make will be so weird 
uh, that I was talking about in the last class, like I'm now reading Hitler's life. And you just see that it was just the sanity of, no, we are better than everybody else. And the, you know, the Jews, they're, they're the problem and they've done this. And, and just rearranging history to suit your purposes, rearranging facts to suit your purposes, just because, and I don't even know if it's a devious, mischievous thing, or is that they, they just have no discrimination anymore and they can't even think. They just assume that every word that's coming out of their mouth is right. And so you've got that aspect. And then the final and the kind of bal more balancing reality is humor. You know, Swami always said that a good sense of humor is essential on the spiritual path. And you have to start not taking yourself, <laughs> not taking the people around you too it's seriously. <laughs> because if you start doing that, it gets harder and harder. You have to just realize, oh boy, <laughs> this is going to be fun. And as long as you can keep that element, this is going to be fun, this is going to be you know, a joyful experience, even while it looks hard. That's really a, um, the attitude to hold in any, especially in this particular case, was the freedom struggle. But ours is also a freedom struggle. We're also struggling for our own freedom and up can apply the exact same principles in the process. I was reading here these two words that I really loved and I think I have learned the most lately when he says about, you know, daily wrestling with practical details. Hmm. That's something that for many of us, when we come to the spiritual path, we feel God will take care of them. That's really not important. Ah, there is something there that needs to be changed. Somebody else will do it. And it's not my responsibility. Or I don't want to deal with this. I joined the spiritual path, so I wouldn't need to, you know, deal with these little details of life. But in fact, once you develop the ability to be practical in your idealism, and you open yourself to do whatever takes to make that happen and you are not afraid to live in the world and and deal with the responsibilities and the you know practicality of it that's when the true balance comes from i remember when i joined more closely in the smaller circle of swami kriyananda's staff and I was already several years on the path and I was, you know, deeply committed and my meditations were very deep, very strong, you know, that was my priority. Everything else really didn't matter to me that much. But only when I entered into his aura, into his orbit, I only then balanced myself because there were so many little practical daily details that needed to be done in order for Swamiji to fulfill his mission, in order for him to meet somebody else, to attend that lecture, to book that hotel. To, I mean, the, the practical daily realities that shouldn't be discarded or discarded in the name of spirituality. And one thing that I have noticed those people that join the spiritual path who have had great responsibilities in life, even a householder wife who has to deal with so many practical realities, when they come to the path, they go very far, very quickly, because there is something within them that has been already developed. For them, everything matters, every tiny, detail and I'm not talking here about becoming obsessive with you know controlling everything I mean you have to find your balance there but the, but the point here is the more practical we become in the world as well the more we will bring that into our sadhana into our spiritual practices practices in our approach to the path itself so don't underestimate that when you see something and nobody else has done it yet, do it. Or where you see something that can be improved, do it. No matter how worldly it seems to you, 
because perhaps through that action, you are already getting closer to your own balance inwardly. Punctually at eight o'clock, Gandhi ended his silence. The Herculean labors of his life require him to apportion his time minutely. Welcome, Swamiji. The, Mahatma greeting, the Mahatma's greeting this time was not via paper. We had just descended from the roof to his writing room, simply furnished with square mats, no chairs, a low desk with books, papers, and a few ordinary pens. He writes here in parenthesis, not found in pens, which um, I don't quite know what that means, but he thought it was important to mention. Maybe it has something to do with the, <laughs> that they are manufactured by the British or who knows. A nondescript clock ticked in a corner, an all pervasive aura of peace and devotion. Gandhi was bestowing one of his captivating, cavernous, almost toothless smiles. Years ago, he explained, I started my weekly observance of a day of silence as a means for gaining time to look after my correspondence. But now, those 24 hours have become a vital spiritual need. A periodical decree of silence is not a torture, but a blessing. I agreed wholeheartedly. So, of course, this is something most spiritual paths talk about. The need for seclusion, the need one day to especially silence this mon vrat, you know, to be able to kind of hold back on some of those outward elements of our life. And, and our speech and words are, uh, it's an interesting thing. The more we speak, the more often we're compelled to share our thoughts outwardly, the less aware sometimes we are of our thoughts because that process from you know, thinking to expressing happens very quickly. When uh, you take some days where you're not getting to express your thoughts, you get to really just sit with your thoughts and you start to realize <laughs> that, wow, I have all sorts of thoughts in my mind. And it's a wonderful way to become a little bit more aware and then you start weighing which thoughts are worthy of expression, which aren't. Of course, it saves a ton of prana and life force that we don't even realize we expend through talking every day. And so it's a very restorative, but also very spiritually uplifting practice to be able to just um, kind of hold back on the compulsion, really, to feel the need to constantly express what it is that you're feeling, thinking, or experiencing. In fact, the positive side of this chakra mm -hmm. is develops calmness um. and expansion. So I don't know if you have noticed those people that have a tendency to talk too much constantly, there is a restlessness about them. You know, there is like almost even before they talk, you know, you just feel there is a restlessness there that it's very hard. To, to stop, to calm down, to, to withdraw that energy. And they automatically, you know, sucks, you know, they sag you into that restlessness that you have to be very centered not to, you know, <laughs> exchange uh, each other at that restless state. But, but the more we consciously practice silence, you know, with that awareness, this is a spiritual practice rather than I'm silent, but I'm also watching a movie and I'm doing this mm -hmm. and I'm keeping myself busy, you know, where, where you just don't talk, but inwardly, mentally, you keep yourself restless. I mean, the practice of silence is I'm consciously withdrawing and interiorizing my energy the ability to communicate outwardly, but I'm using that energy to communicate inwardly, bringing, uplifting all that energy upwards. And, and, and then and only then you feel that restorative energy and, and the calmness that the practice of silence brings into your consciousness. So, so it's not just be quiet. You can see sometimes people, they, they don't talk because they just better not to talk. Uh, otherwise, I will say something. And they use silence, you know, as a mean of not 
really releasing, releasing that anger or that energy, but a conscious practice of silence that brings calmness and a very, in a very healing way. So yeah, the practice of it. The Mahatma questioned me about America and Europe, and we discussed India and world conditions. Mahadev Gandhi said to Mr. Desai, as he entered the room, please make arrangements at town hall for Swamiji to speak there on yoga tomorrow night. So that's easier for them. Tomorrow, let's organize a, an event. Takes us a little longer nowadays to organize these events. As I was bidding the Mahatma good night, he considerately handed me a bottle of citronella oil. The Vardha mosquitoes don't know a thing about Ahimsa, Swamiji, he said, laughing. The following morning, our little group breakfasted early on a tasty wheat porridge with molasses and milk. At 10.30, we were called to the ashram porch for lunch with Gandhi and the Satyagrahis. 10.30, they had lunch. So that's an interesting thing. That yeah. means they probably had breakfast at, I don't know, early, 5 o'clock, 6 yeah. o'clock in the morning or something. So they were definitely hungry by then. Today, the menu included brown rice, a new selection of vegetables, and cardamom seeds. Noon found me strolling about the ashram grounds onto the grazing land of a few imperturbable, imperturbable, yeah, there we go, cows. The protection of cows is a passion with Gandhi. The cow to me, to me means the entire subhuman world, extending man's sympathies beyond his own species. The Mahatma has explained. Man, through the cow, is enjoined to realize his identity with all that lives. Why the ancient rishis selected the cow for apotheosis is obvious to me. The cow in India was the best comparison, for she was a giver of plenty. Not only did she give milk, but she also made agriculture possible. The cow is a poem of pity. One reads pity in the gentle animal. She is the second mother to millions of mankind. Protection of the cow means protection of the whole dumb creation of God. The appeal of the lower order of creation is all the more forceful because it is speechless. <clears throat> so of course we know in India the cow is regarded very highly, in fact, oftentimes as highly as God himself or the Dev does. And <clears throat> there are certain re reasons traditionally, but I like Gandhiji's explanation of this, not so much where we are specifically sing, kind of single, you know, just picking out singly the cow, but using it as a represent, representation for all lower life forms. Of course, the cow because she also gives so much. And in a village reality, we don't have that so much today, but in a village reality, the cow is like the life of the house because she really just gives everything the house needs. She allows farming, of course, she gives milk, but then also her, you know, the cow dung is used for many things. Um, what else is used out of a cow? The urine is used in the cow for, and Several then, reasons, yeah. And, and then, cow dung is used not only as a as an act antibacterial, and it's used on the flooring, on the walls. It's also used as fuel for cooking. I mean, so you've you, you've got this one kind of creature, and her presence is just allowing you really to live a very complete life. And she's just she's a giver, you know. It's very, it doesn't take that much for her. It's not like, oh, I'm going to hold back my cow dung so that it's, it's just coming every day plentifully. And I like the last line here. And this is something that I'd never thought of before, even though we've read the autobiography many times. These are little things that don't come to our mind. And he says, the appeal of the lower order of creation is all the more forceful because it is speechless. And we're just talking about silence. But animals don't get to speak. They don't get to express themselves. You see, as humans, we're constantly telling you what we want. Mama, I want this. Now I need that. This. 
you know, our, our, we're just, we express ourselves so often so that when somebody listens to you and takes, says, okay, oh, you want water, here's some water. Oh, you want food, here's some food. But with animals, they're never saying anything. They don't say, I want this, I want that, now give me this, now it's time for my bath. You have to, out of the very openness and attuned heart, you have to tune into them, you have to feel them, you have to understand them, because they won't speak. They can't express themselves. And it could be an interesting experiment. People who have pets, you know, I know that they, they start to develop a certain inner attunement to their pets. Just by looking at them, they can tell if the pet is uncomfortable, unhappy, having some issue going on, because they don't have any way to express themselves. If I go through any trouble, I'm the first one to, you know, broadcast it as much as possible. Hey, I'm not feeling so well today, so you know, that means I, I, I deserve everyone's sympathy a lot more today. Whatever it is, we, we, we don't, we're never hold back on whatever it is that we need from the world, not just from people. But the animal kingdom, it's just, it's silent, it's mute. And whatever it receives, especially from the human, it has to receive kind of unasked for. And we have to really understand what it is in each moment. And it could be a wonderful practice, in fact, to use that to, as a means to tune in also to people and to tune into their hidden, speechless, mm -hmm. silent needs. That when they don't speak it, we're still aware of it. And uh, a wonderful way to look at this whole idea of cow protection, of supporting these lower life forms. Uh, Yogananda actually builds on this concept a little more, and let's see what else he says. There are three daily rituals on the Orthodox Hindu that are enjoined on the Orthodox Hindu. One is Bhuta Yagya, an offering of food to the animal kingdom. This ceremony symbolizes man's realization of his obligations to less evolved forms of creation instinctively tied to bodily identifications, which also corrode human life, but lacking in the quality of liberating reason, which is peculiar to humanity. So that's one, Yogananda Ji is saying, that's one dividing factor, we can say, of what we would call a lower life form as compared to the human form, is a bodily, you know, realities and functions are their primary kind of mode of, of staying connected to this, to this form of creation. And they don't have the ability to reason, and he calls it liberating reason, our ability to kind of go beyond the body when the need calls for it, go beyond our likes and dislikes when the need calls for it, to be able to kind of use those aspects of our brains that allow us to, in fact, separate ourselves from reality when we need or when the need arises. Bhuti Yagya thus reinforces man's readiness to succor the weak as he in turn is comforted by countless, by countless solicitudes of higher unseeing beings. Now I love this part very much yeah. because here it's what dumb animals, dumb as in speechless, those can't, who can't speak, not dumb as in who, are, who don't have the mental capacity, but when a, the animal kingdom, which is dumb, in relation to us, is like us in relation to the higher astral beings. We're the dumb animals <laughs> for them. And they're constantly supporting, yes. helping, guiding, you know, and just allowing different aspects of creation to function, but also more specifically individuals. We're all being guided. Remember in the astral world, we talked all, all about it. They're the beings, our thoughts are causal beings. Our very energy is our astral beings. And depending on where our consciousness is, those vibration of beings are the ones guiding and supporting us. If we lower our consciousness, it becomes harder for them to do so. When we raise our consciousness, it becomes much easier for them to do so. So it's an interesting thing for us to look at these two kingdoms, right? The animal kingdom, the human kingdom, and let's call Angelic. it the angel kingdom, for the lack of a better word. 
and the relationship between these three. If we can tune in to the lower life forms from the same perspective as astral beings, causal beings are tuning into us, that would again, you know, these are just very peculiar perspectives to hold so that it just shifts and we don't just assume this is it, this is the one creation and you know, I'm up here and these guys are down here so I don't need to really deal with them because this is my reality. But as we see in all three worlds, there is a constant movement. The ones at a higher space are always looking to find ways to uplift the lower, and the ones at the lower space are always looking upward for upliftment. You know? And so that, that kind of constant exchange needs to happen and is happening oftentimes subconsciously without our full awareness. But this just gives us a little more like, okay, wow, I, this could be a fun way for me to start relating to animals now. <laughs> and see it in the same term as the astral and causal worlds related to us. Man is also under bond, under bond, for rejuvenating gifts of nature, prodigal in earth, sea and sky. The evolutionary barrier of incommunicability among nature, animals, man and astral angels is thus overcome by offices of silent love. And so that's the communication mm -hmm. process. While we can't speak to the higher astral beings, or we can speak, but we don't know whether any of it is being registered, and we can't hear them, the same goes on. We can speak to these animals, and we can't quite figure out if it's registering. But that quality and that vibration of love, of course, registers perfectly and beautifully. And that's really what we're working with, not so much the, you know, you see uh, in, on the streets when you go in Bombay or wherever, you'll see a cow tied somewhere in a corner and a person sitting next to the cow. And you'll see people come and, you know, they'll buy some little ball of something and feed it to the cow. And <clears throat> because, you know, oh, Bhuti Yagya, this is part of what I need to do. It's, a, it's an obligation as an orthodox Hindu on me to feed a lower life form. But you don't, you don't see <laughs> any form of communication <laughs> trying to happen there. You just see them, ye kharida, ye khilaya, nikal gaye. As, as, as kuch kiya with the cow. You know, it's just like, that's it. I don't really know, I don't really understand what's trying to happen here. I'm not really looking at the cow as a representation of something larger and greater. I'm just fulfilling some kind of almost superstitious requirement that says this is something I need to do every day. Or, and most people then attribute that to success and failure in their lives. Oh, I didn't feed the cow for the last two days, so therefore today, you know, I almost got hit by a truck. And so this is how most people's kind of reasoning faculty is used, <laughs> not too far away from the animal kingdom. But we have to realize, wow, there's an obligation, as Yogananda-ji says, to all lower life forms as through this quality of love to recognize and tune in because they can't speak, because they cannot communicate. Wow, what could they be wanting? What could they be experiencing? Are they comfortable? Are they enjoying being tied to the side of the road and being stuffed with food by every passing person who comes? Is that something the cow is kind of particularly wanting or experiencing? And that's, that's something worth tuning into as well. And then, of course, not just the cow, but any lower form. We had a monkey yesterday, a langur, sitting right here at uh, next to the ashram. And everybody was, you know, it became a little bit of a spectacle, but a very, it was just so cool, so calm and composed. People came and gave it bananas, and it just took him and ate him. People gave it cookies, and it was eating him. And, you know, dogs were running after it, and crows were trying to attack it because... <laughs> Everybody was a little worried by this presence of this langur, but uh, he was really calm. He didn't particularly, you know, he, he found a place where the dogs couldn't get to him. He found a place where the crows couldn't get to him, and he enjoyed his. But you could see a lot of people, for some people it was a spectacle, but for some people there was this natural, oh my goodness, you know, what can I, how can I help this animal? He seems lost because that's what he was. He was lost, uh, separated from his tribe. The other two daily yagyas are Pitri and Nri Pitri yagya, which is an offering of oblations to ancestors 
as a symbol of man's acknowledgement of his debt to the past, essence of whose wisdom illuminates humanity today. And Nri Yagya is an offering of food to strangers or to the poor, symbol of the present responsibilities of man and his duties to contemporaries. So we've got these three, you can say, obligations, responsibilities that are upon us. And we can tune into them in different ways. Uh, you know, of course, there are certain ritualistic expressions that exist, which is a wonderful beginning. But so these three are an obligation to those who are know, lower on the evolutionary scale. This doesn't only include animals, but could include also humans, you know, people who are having a harder time than we are in life. Nature. Yeah, nature herself, yeah, the environment. Then there is to the past, to the energy that has brought us to this point. It's really our ancestors really are our karma. It, it's not so much the people per se. It is the karmic kind of generational yeah, directions that have been created that have brought us to this point. And it is only vibrationally if we resonate with these karmic directions that we are born into certain families and born into certain countries, born into certain time periods, cultures, cultures languages. I mean, it's all a karmic flow. Of, you, know, you can't kind of just fit in there out of just a, a mistake. It has to be a certain resonance. And that's the ancestral energy. It's, it's the energy that propels us. It's the power that has brought us till this point. And then, of course, to the present reality, to those in need right here, right now. What's going on in the world? What's going on in my life? Who are the people most in need? And they don't have to be lower or higher. It's just this idea that I'm obligated to uplift. I'm obligated to add to wherever I am. I'm obligated to leave a space, a situation, this world, when I leave it completely, to have left it in a more uplifted, more meaningful uh, state than when I found it. So these are three very wonderful aspects. And every day we can ask ourselves this. You know, did I tune into somebody, a lower life form today? Did I tune into some present reality? And was I aware of the energy from the past that has brought me to this moment? Re-entering the guest house, I was struck anew by the stark simplicity and evidences of self-sacrifice which are everywhere present. This is at the ashram. The Gandhi vow of non-possession came early in his married life, renouncing an extensive legal practice which had been yielding him an annual income of more than $20,000. The Mahatma dispersed all his wealth to the poor. Sri Yukteswar used to poke gentle fun at the commonly inadequate conceptions of renunciation. A beggar cannot renounce wealth, master would say. If a man laments, my business has failed, my wife has left me, I will renounce all and enter a monastery. To, that worldly, to what worldly sacrifice is he referring? He did not renounce wealth and love, they renounced him. And this is another attitude. A lot of people come, in, it's not with renunciation per se, but onto the spiritual path. Oh, this is not working, that is not working, this is hard and that is hard, chalo. <laughs> Let's try this, you know, spiritual aspect out. Seems it's easier here and they're nicer people and <laughs> they will at least listen to me. And over here I'm completely neglected, but these people are open to my presence. And a lot of energy often comes where we're just looking for uh, support and succor and just, you know, I, I think this is going to be easier because the alternative is a lot harder. And those who come with that attitude, of course, never really remain. They come when they're hurting and they're a little broken, but the th moment things get just a little better, that's it. Okay, <laughs> done. <laughs> I don't need to meditate anymore. I don't need to follow any of these principles anymore. And then you, they disappear for a while until another little tragedy strikes in their life. And once again, you... You hear from them once again. They're back in your orbit once again. They say, "I need to, I need to restart my meditation practice." And, you know, each time, of course, you say, "Great, wonderful, let's do this again." Because, you know, we know experience. That's how, as Gandhiji was, it just takes experience. We go, we swing, 
always extremes. Oh, it's hard, let's do something about it. Now it's not hard, let's not do anything about it. And these are the two expressions that most of us try to live our life by. We don't have that middle path where I'm always committed to that principle, irrespective of what my life looks like. I was thinking about the yamas and niyamas. Mm -hmm. Because once you get it right on the spiritual path, once you find your ways of how to go about it and cooperate with the spiritual laws and the law of karma, you can become abundance and bring a lot of prosperity into your life right away. I mean, if you get it right, if you really learn how to navigate on the spiritual path, the universe suddenly, you know, turns completely towards you and starts showering you, you know, with, with the law of abundance and prosperity and magnetism and expansion in all areas of your life and wisdom and newer insights and inspiration. I mean, you become suddenly quite well <laughs> equipped <laughs> to become, you know, a little bit more grandiose than what we were used to and more comfortable, you know, the basics needs are not just basics, you know, just suddenly there is so much more inflow of energy at the three levels, you know, materially, spiritually, emotionally, you know, we, we develop certain things within us that, wow, they are just quite good. And the risk is that we start becoming not just more comfortable with it, but more of it. And that's where the trap of the ego comes in. And it's so important that we find a way, no matter how prosperous we are, that the practices of the yams and niyams are daily in our lives. I mean, if nothing else, I would say make sure that you, yes, challenge yourself of you know, the non-possession, the contentment, you know, I have all these things, but if all these things are given, are taken away from me, will I be able to still be chill about it and not lose my temper? And if things don't go in the way I was hoping, am I still loving and non-judgmental and happy in myself? I mean, if those things are not put into practice, I mean, then what's the point of, you know, attracting the law of abundance if then we cannot deal with the basics? And, and I think this is a very, very important aspect of the spiritual life. I mean, let's all make sure, if nothing else, that the yamas and niyamas are religiously <laughs> practiced daily, little ways. They don't need to be in big ways, but just to be safe on the path that you know, there are certain things we cannot just be uh, comfortable about it or fool ourselves with the thought that having abundance means spirituality, because it's not. You know, you can have abundance, but how are you dealing with it is what will make that abundance powerful or not in your life and those around you. In fact, that's just what you're saying is in the next paragraph as well, kind of emphasizing mm -hmm. that point. As Master says, saints like Gandhi, on the other hand, have made not only tangible material sacrifices, but also the more difficult renunciation of selfish motive and private goal, merging their inmost being in the stream of humanity as a whole. What does that mean? Now, as Narayani said, was a lot, as our magnetism changes and increases, it really magnetizes everything into our life. Whether you've asked for it or not, it just starts coming. That's the very nature of magnetism. You know, abundance comes, support comes, people come, insights come. Intuition comes. Intuition comes. And in that moment, if we don't, you know, if we're not able to renounce, as it says over here, selfish motive and any private goals, you're going to have to realize how to use that. This is, you know, Gandhi, of course, was living, I mean, I don't want to say like a beggar, but, you know, at a very, very, very minimal level. But he was raising millions and millions and millions of rupees every day. 
later on it says over here that you know the men would ask their wives not to go wearing any jewelry because if they would hear him speak about the freedom struggle and how much that they should give all the women right then and there would take away all their gold and all their jewels and just leave it at his feet so that's the kind of magnetism he had you know people who otherwise pride themselves in all that they have but in his presence they just all they wanted to do was give and so this man's not you know he's living consciously a very simple life but what he's drawing is on a level that almost very 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 few people have been able to draw so the difference here is as narayani was saying that those practices he had no private goal there everything he received was re kind of engaged in the upliftment of others tuning in and i like these words merging their inmost being in the stream of humanity as a whole that their desires become the desires of others their goals become the goals of others their hopes become the hopes of others and that's really a a great way to start shaving off the ego in fact it's the expansion of ego i'm not just thinking of myself anymore i'm thinking for a hundred other people so my sense of self has now included a hundred that's another beautiful you can say aspect of having a family life you know is that i don't think for myself i have to think for four people five people two people three people whatever it is of course we then close ourselves to it and say and this is it and no more and anybody who is outside the circle i will not think for them but as we grow spiritually in the right way we are we naturally start thinking about what about this person what about their needs what about that other reality and little by little that's how magnetism is allowed to increase and grow as well is because our very sense of self expands with it but you have to in the beginning especially be very strong renounce selfish motive and private goal in the beginning it will take effort afterwards it becomes just natural afterwards you can no longer think too much of yourself it just just is impossible the consciousness your mind won't even allow you to go there just as now a father or a mother naturally includes their child in every decision it, their consciousness just won't allow them to not think about that you know because they've identified so fully with their children of course sometimes that identity leads to a lot of attachment and expectation but let's assume that <laughs> that's another thing to take care of in this case you see that selfish motive and private goal means no expectations or attachments from the people that you're serving either but you see how your identity just completely shifts and that's a that's an mm-hmm. experience worth having i was thinking about swami kriyananda and his life and what he was able to achieve i mean everything he did had nothing to do with himself mm-hmm. i mean everything he has left behind was for us to use it in the way we want it i mean that's that's up to us but he has left behind uh, a legacy and the energy he had to put into it the amount of time and money involved and three continents i mean that's that's amazing he didn't even want a salary from the very beginning he said i don't want to have any salary nor any royalties nor any royalties of any of my books any of my music any of my community any of my creative deeds i don't want anything for myself i want it to be used in the most uplifting way and and be shared for as many people as possible because he had a deep belief i mean it was a knowing god is going to take care of myself and he's going to provide whatever i need and even more and even the inspiration behind creating things because i only have one desire which is to share god and truth with as many people as possible and that desire created ananda that desire manifested 150 books 400 pieces of music 
and classes and lectures and communities and art, name it. But he didn't do it for himself, but for us. And you need to find what do you want to leave behind? What are the things that you are doing daily that have no personal motive? Maybe for now it's just only one tiny little thing. Start with that, magnetize that. And then when you become, when you have perfected the ability to, I'm doing this really without any selfish, selfish motive, just because it, you know, I want for God to flow through me in this particular way. Just keep finding ways to do that more often throughout the day until you become a pure channel and the only result of your existence is to allow God to flow through you and uplift others. And, and I think I want to believe this is the reason why we are really joining the spiritual path to achieve that level of consciousness where we become such pure channels that we are here because it has nothing to do with us. We are here because God needs channels. And I want to be one of those channels where he gets to do and act through me, not my little ego. Hmm. That's powerful. Very nice. Thank you. This is our final paragraph, I believe, for today. This is now bringing in Mahatma Gandhiji's wife. The Mahatma's remarkable wife, Kasturba, did not object when he failed to set aside any part of his wealth for the use of herself and their children. Married in early youth, Gandhi and his wife took the vow of celibacy after the birth of several sons. A tranquil heroine in the intense drama that has been their life together, Kasturba has followed her husband to prison, shared his three-week fasts, and fully borne her share of his endless responsibilities. And goes on and we'll go into this next class where she pays this particular tribute to Gandhiji. That's a little longer than we have time for. But you just also see that nobody, you know, including the saints, including the greatest masters, can do anything alone. You always need somebody to help you, to support you, to be part of what you're doing. Everybody needs, in this world, everybody needs somebody to support them. And uh, that's really a part of when we're trying to build and create something. You look for those people who will truly support you. you know, because otherwise, half the time you have to, <laughs> you're dealing with the energy they bring into the process. And you know, it can be at cross purposes with what is trying to happen. But everywhere, the guru and then his first disciple, you know, that's, the, that's where he knows his mission has began. And you and whoever else, your partner in whichever form, but somebody somewhere, you find somebody of like mind, you find somebody of an equal zeal. And in, particular, in Gandhiji's particular case, I don't think his wife, I think it was a little bit of an imposition on her. But she rose to the occasion and eventually became really the strength that he needed to be able to do all this. Because it does take, you need people to kind of Support give you, you and add yeah. strength. I remember Swamiji, um, when Master died and Rajasthi Janakananda became uh, the president and the successor to Paramahansa Yogananda Ji, he one day says to Swami Kriyananda, you have a great work to do and Master will give you the strength to do it. And at that time, of course, it just meant what it meant. Like, okay, the Guru is going to just flow through me and give me a lot of strength. and. But several decades later, and Swamiji was addressing a large group of disciples at Ananda village, Swamiji said, I now realize, finally, what Rajarsi meant. He says, because when he told me, you know, you have a great work to do and Master will give you the strength, he says, now I realize you all are that strength. And that's what it takes. The strength comes from the people who are just as... Passionate. Intensely passionate as you are. And look for those people in your life because you're going to need them. Everybody's going to need that kind of support. So perhaps that could be a wonderful way to tune into.
what kind of friends to have, what kind of support to bring into your life. Who else is just as passionate, and just as willing to sacrifice for whatever cause it, cause it is that you've created in life. And, uh, and isn't it what Master also does before he's about to reincarnate again? No? Yeah. He asks, who wants to come down with <laughs> me? Who, who wants to do the job? Because it's not, not going to be easy and I need that help. And the same that Babaji has his, you know, smaller group of disciples. And okay, who who wants to come and help? And they start working more closely with those who are, as Swamiji said, willing channels. So yeah, I think there is a a role to play for each one of us. We just need to find, you know, who we want to, you know, associate with and. Who, who do we want to be the strength of mm -hmm. and the support of? True. And that's a very noble way to <laughs> do live. it, live. <laughs> OK, everybody, with that okay. idea, go support somebody. Go find somebody who will support you. And Jai Guru, Jai in the Guru. meantime, see you all. Tomorrow we won't have a satsang. We're having a half a day Kriyaban retreat at the ashram, so which is our time to work with those of us who have our Kriya practice, just go deep in it. If you are a Kriyaban, wherever you are, do pray for us and keep us in your thoughts as will we. Jai Guru. Jai Guru.